collision itself and increasing diameter of the uh, grinding balls that i was all uh, i was talking that if i can increase the diameter of the grinding ball there is one way how the energy uh, during uh, the ball milling can be uh, uh, ball milling can be increased so higher extent of grinding jar filling uh, lower extent of the grinding balls and reduced uh, that can that that two factors is going to reduce the milling efficiency so in this model you can understand that uh, what are the factors need to be controlled so that the uh, efficiency of the ball milling or efficiency of the particle fragmentation can be uh, enhanced so this is another way of modeling of the milling parameters in one particular observations uh, this is a complex equation so i'm not going to details of every that particular part but i'm trying to explain that what are the different uh, factors that are yeah going to influence the power power of the milling power of the milling basically comes what is the speed of rotation what is the acceleration of the what, what is the g value uh, gravitational accelerations of the a particular mill that is depends upon what is the power of the milling it is generated and how much it is transmitted to the uh, while so it, it is not always uh, very uh, important to understand that uh, whatever the power is generated by the mill may or may not the uh, it is contributing to the extent of so it is very important the a transmission ratio is also important so what does it means that how much amount of power is generated in the milling in the ball mill so and how much is actually getting uh, reflected in the uh, in, inside the jar itself so that is also quite important number of the balls i have talked about extent of the vial filling so in one particular uh, model so this all the parameters are actually getting involved so whatever the parameters i, I was discussing that the how many numbers of balls i should take what is the extent, extent of the vial filling and related with the geometry and diameter of the ball k is a factor which is related with the geometry and diameter of the ball uh, specifically all the balls are of spherical shape elasticity of the collisions uh, so uh, depending upon uh, the ball mass ball diameter plate rotating speed so two uh, two th things is important one is a plate rotating speed what is the uh, plate that means uh, what is the mill is rotating in what uh, rpm and what is the vial is rotating in what rpm so i am talking about both are not exactly same that my mill is rotating in this rpm and my vial is rotating in this particular speed both are may not uh, be same because that's really the transmission ratio is uh, more and more important and uh, uh, volume of the individual balls vp uh, vp is the volume of the powders mp is the mass of the powders uh, that also is uh, going to influence and uh, vt is basically the volume of the vial and uh, hv is the vial height and uh, uh basically uh, rho v is basically the average density of the powder so that that is these are the factors which actually influences the uh the, the all the uh, power that is being generated during the milling process and every effort should be there to increase the power uh, or increase the kinetic energy of the milling so if the uh, ball uh, mill can generate a higher and higher amount of power there is every possibility that uh, the uh, the vial can also run with a very high speed but but because of that's why in uh, present context uh the research is concentrated more on the high energy ball milling rather than the low energy which can generate more and more amount of power because if the mill doesn't generate too much amount of power i cannot uh, run the balls to a very or cannot run the balls to a very larger speed and that is also eventually can uh, reduce my efficiency of the ball mill process so this is a second factor what is important i am coming into the compaction uh, till now i was discussing about the Uh, design uh, how to design during the synthesis either mechanical alloying or the uh, or the condensation process now in the compaction process so uh, one thing is quite important that what is happening in the compaction first things has to be mentioned that in compaction process there is a one die which is a uh, could be made of uh, tool steel or it could be made of tungsten carbide uh, coated uh, uh, steel or uh, in another case uh it it could be made of only of pure uh, tool steel so two things can happen and uh, two different mechanism can operate one is called the single action compaction where the uh, action or the pressure is been applied only from the top and in uh, double action uh, compaction the pressure is been uh, uh, applied from the both side so uh, which one which one is more favorable whether it is single action compactions where the and there is a uh, this is upper punch it has been uh, injected inside the die and uh, between this uh, lower punch and the upper punch there is a uh, powder which is going to be compacted now uh, specifically uh, linear regression methods provides a model to comprehend the relative density and hardness of the powder so uh, there is a linear relationship uh, rho is equal to 19.306 uh, log hv plus 39.831 so specifically it's uh, it gives a very linear relationship that if the hardness uh, the density is higher then the hardness of the product is very very higher and uh, obviously uh, uh, there is another impact that hardness is measured 
measurement in the constricted area so th that is very important that hardness i am measuring the hardness in particular uh, particular uh, in which uh, mode i am actually measuring the hardness uh, if i am measuring the hardness in the bulk so the hardness value may get some erroneous and there is some error is been mentioned that how much error in the hv it is present so um, so it's basically two uh, uh, major uh, modeling that normally been uh, used in the in this particular context one is the idquas and one is the Ab abacus uh, if you solver both are basically used to model the compaction parameters and uh, in that particular context the input should be i am coming into more details of that so input should be the die punch design powder compaction dimension what should be the dimension of the powder compact but uh, what should be the die and punch design whether it's a rectangular die whether it's a cylindrical die coefficient of friction is another important factor upper and lower limit of the process parameter that means uh, what should be the up, uh, pressure upper uh, limit of the pressure what should be the lower limit of the pressure what uh, should be the uh, time uh, because after the compaction is over certain amount of time should be there which is called as a dual time so that uh, the pressure is uniformly transmitted the all throughout the cross section of the sample so uh, the time should be given so the upper and lower boundary limit should be uh, should be provided in that particular uh, particular input and movement of the punch how the punch will move that also need to be uh, provided into the as as an input so now uh, I, I was talking about that two different modes of uh, compacting or pressurizing what uh, normally could take place and why how modeling is quite a bit of effective in this particular context so uh, if i can model if i can go with certain ideas that uh, if i so specifically for any application uh, my major objective i should not uh, uh, constrict my sample with a very laboratory scale so i should increase the l by d ratio now the challenge is that if i go on increasing the height to diameter ratio so the challenge is that whether i could get a um, uh, get a very small deviation in the density gradient or whether my density gradient is going to be deviated in a uh, in a drastically so there will be a localized uh, density variation can take place and uh, that will leads towards anisotropic material property that means the if, uh, if if the density is not so i, I have uh, shown what actually happens in the single action compaction process so at the surface at the top with the load is getting applied and to some region of the subsurface area there is a high density region is been uh, formed so if i actually cut it in the uh, cut it in this cross section area so and I, if i get the density uh, so i will find that the density is comparatively higher and if i go on deep inside the sample i will find that the density is comparatively less rather than the high, uh, high side so that what does it means that means uh, if i go on increasing the hbt ratio the pressure transmission is not significant so that from the top of the surface to the bottom end the pressure is properly transmitted so i will get a lower density region and that's why the material will uh, exhibit the diversified property at different region so that is not well acceptable and that will leads towards um, failure without giving warning in actual structural application if i go on double axing uh, compaction so what is going to happen the uh, the region of the low density region is going to reduce because now i am pressurizing so pressure has been uh, transmitted from top and from the bottom so how in how many areas so researcher try to understand in how many areas i should uh, pressurize my sample from the top or from the bottom uh, so in double action compaction so uh, the density gradient is going to reduce and i i will get a more unified or uh, homogeneous uh, density almost uh, not fully homogeneous almost homogeneous distribution so uh, rather than that if i go with this uh, very classical way of understanding uh, another way is the isostatic pressing that means from the top pressure is application from the top from the bottom from both side if i try to apply pressure so i will try to transmit pressure from all the side so i can produce a, a sample of a, my desired dimension uh, with a very lesser amount of density gradient so that is one of the way how reduction in the density gradient can takes place by isostatic compaction so at present uh, isostatic compaction has has an Im immense influence as far as the uh, as far as the compaction is concerned now there are certain models which uh, is uh, uh, i have talked about that there are very long time they are actually uh, present so uh, one is called the rw heckels models and uh, panelis and ambrose philo model so what does it shows one thing is quite important that till now i have to, i was talking about the, what is the extent of nanostructure now i am talking about what is the density of the sample and and if the density whatever i have done if the density first of all uh, why there is a need of uh, improving the density 
why there are so many costly equipments for an example spark mass machinery costing more than one one crore rupees is uh, uh, getting more and more important so because to improve the density with a uh, very uh, minimal grain growth that will provide a significant en enhancement in the mechanical property so a very simplified the model that what is the effect how much pressure i should apply and what is the effect of the pressure on the density the model has been developed uh, first of all in rwo heckels uh, in uh, 1961 and uh, uh, in the 90 long after that panelis has uh, modified uh, to some extent that model and uh, in that what panelis has been done that ln 1 by 1 minus d is equal to a root over p plus b that means if i go on uh, increasing the pressure so a, a particular model uh, can be plotted and a linear feed can be expected that is ln 1 by 1 minus d in the y axis uh, d is basically the uh this is basically the density or uh, relative density of the sample that means what is the density uh, i am getting after the compaction is over divided uh, divided by the theoretical density so uh, this uh, this that value and uh, and specifically the p is basically the square root of the pressure that has been applied so if i get a, a linear fit so from the linear fit uh, from the slope and uh, and uh, the intercept intercept will is, is the b value and slope is basically the a value so a will give that what is the effective of the uh, particle rearrangement and uh, b is basically the densification due to particle rolling in die and rearrangement two things can happen so one is why this model is so important what are the deliverables that can be understand from the model so one is two things can happen first of all and particle rearrangement can take place in two different way so first of all when i was filling the uh, so first of all the die has to fill with the powder and then the uh, the lower punch is been given then the die is filled with a uh, uh, certain amount of powder and then the upper punch is given when the die is filling so the particle during filling itself the part, some amount of the particle rearrangement can take place and uh, in another case uh, the particle rearrangement can takes place uh, pro propensity of the part, uh, packing by particle rearrangement so how, what is the extent of the particle rearrangement one is during the rolling process itself and one is by uh, uh, that that is called the tap density and one is the propensity of packing uh, packing during the applied densification uh, applied pressure so two things is important and that will give an idea that uh, with applied pressure what is the extent of particle by a and b value you can understand that what is the extent what i need to change how much pressure i should apply so that my a i can i can uh, improve the particle rearrangement i can improve uh, the particle rearrangement how much pressure i could apply so that the a value can be uh, a value can be improved and uh, that's why this model has so much important because if i can uh, regulate the pressure and if i can improve the d value the final uh, densification during heat treatment can also be getting enhanced so one way to improve the final property or uh, specifically the final densification is to improve the densification uh, specifically in the pressureless sintering process is to improve the densification in the uh, powder uh, compaction process so one of my student has uh, trying to study two different way and uh, here also shows that why modeling is so important so i am giving a, some live examples uh, why modeling is so much of important so two alloys they have a consolidated in one um, alloy ods alloy tungsten based ods alloys it is properly compacted it shows no deformation after during uh, it has removed from the die uh, so it has so no deformation no side cracks no uh, it has retained its original shape what has been uh, expected but in another case it has observed there are some amount of deformation or some amount of brokage has taken place at side so what what to do and what has uh, happened that uh, even uh, everything was constant the pressure was constant in both the cases the time uh, that has been given obviously the uniaxial uh, pressure application is been used but uh, still uh, depending upon the uh, appearance it shows that something has gone wrong so there is no change in the parameters die remains same in both the process die was also not changed certain uh, factors that has uh, may have influence so i have listed down the factors what we have uh, what we have uh, investigated there is a powder welding on the die surface so it is to be ensured that and during the modeling also it has to be uh, understand that what could be the real challenge so then only the actual uh, replication of the model can give a, a, a clear understanding uh, during the actual experimental setup so powder welding on the die surface the, the powder is uh, is uh, properly not cleaned and uh, and also 
uh, if there are some amount of powder which is also going to stick during the deformation, stick with the die work. So that is that is obvious in any compaction process. So uh, so that that is one important that why it actually during ejection process it actually getting broke down. Off centering of the die punch set. So when I'm applying pressure, the load axis and the punch die axis is exactly not uh, exactly not coinciding with each other. So if they are off centering. So that can also lead towards certain amount of so the load application is not uniform all throughout. So that can lead towards the broken edge. Third factor is also quite important that inadequate tolerance of the die punch set, and it is related with the manufacturer. So if the tolerance that means uh, what is that? What is the, how I am actually inserting the punch inside the die? If the tolerance is very very high, if the tolerance is not adequate enough. That can also lead towards uh, the broken edge and some amount of air air entrapment. If there is a air is present, so that is eventually. Uh, very very valid, specifically for the experimental setup. Uh, air, if there is air entrapment, that can also lead towards. So, if there are air entrapment, the even though pressure application, there is no particle rearrangement takes place in this particular design, and uh, therefore uh, a broken uh, edges can be uh, observed. So, this is uh, of the factors that is actually uh, quite important. Now, uh, predicting the compacted pellet shapes can have a better regulation of the process. Why we need the process modeling? First of all, I have to need, predict the the pellet shape should be like this. And if, is there any deformation in the pellet, or if there is any uh, stress, uh, what is the stress distribution in the pellet? So that actually uh, can give a provide a better understanding. One uh, very important relationship is that that sigma t by sigma a is equal to exponential minus c by a, c into h by d. This is a very small equation, but this small equation can provide a large number of idea during the compact. What does it provide? So sigma t is basically the pressure transferred by punch to the compact, and sigma is basically the applied pressure by punch. That means how much pressure I am applying. It is not expected that this uh, re in reality the sigma t by sigma is equal to one. It is not happens in the actually uh, theoretically it is uh, should be one, but uh, practically doesn't happen so exactly. The same. That's why we get a, a difference in the difference in the, the property. Uh, so if the exactly the pressure is transmitted, whatever the pressure actually getting applied, so uh, then uh, the property can be regulated in more uh, uniform way. And it also depends upon the H by D. I was talking about that. It's a for a larger scale development, H by D or the aspect ratio of the sample has a very significant importance. So now if I take a if I And C value is basically related with the four uh, mu w that is the die uh, wall friction k w and uh, epsilon. So th this is basically psi. So basically this k w is basically the relationship between uh, sigma t w that is the um, uh, and sigma a w that is the applied um, stress in the wall and the uh, stress in the uh, is the r w is basically the radial stress and uh, r w is the radial stress and a w is basically the stress on the wall that is in the axial. Axial stress and on the radial stress of the wall. So K is depending upon that. So and and also the friction coefficient between powder and die surface. But how much amount of friction is there? So sometimes it happens that to facilitate the friction, so that the uh, there should not be any deformation. Uh, sample can be injected without any distortion. So some amount of lubricant is been is been given. But uh, uh, in practice, uh, how uh, it has observed that. Uh, and from the equation is observed that if the d value, uh, specifically if the h value is going to increase with a constant d, d I am not changing, but I am changing the length or the uh, or the thickness. If I go on increasing the uh, h value, all of the factors remain same. So sigma t by sigma a is also going to be sigma t is going to be lesser as compared to sigma a. That means the transmitted pressure. I am applying huge amount of pressure, but actually the pressure that is transmitted in the compact is quite less. So that is. Actually, not recommended. The, if the pressure transmission is less, so then the density will suffer. Therefore, if I go on increasing the H value, and uh, so uh, what is actually the problem is that uh, I, I should apply the pressure not from one side, but it should be from uniformly from all sides. That's why the uh, the process of isostatic pressing come into picture. So simply by uh, plotting a linear fit, uh, while uh, can be by ln sigma t by sigma a in, uh, and h by d. A plot from there the value of uh, if I take K W epsilon as a constant, so the die wall friction, so how much amount of die wall friction, uh, friction is basically die wall friction mu W can be uh, can be evaluated. So uh, 
if, if I can understand the dipole frictions, I can actually modulate my process uh, or the, the setup so that uh, how uh, the how basically the powder shape uh, will be, how much amount of stress distribution will be, uh, what are the so all these things I can develop some idea from there. So there are there are two different uh, way uh, that can be considered during the uh, modeling process. One is called the DM discrete uh, uh, element modeling and the finite element modeling. In the discrete, so it basically in the discrete modeling, that is a, one is particulate based and one is constitutive uh, model based. So in the particulate based uh, powder is been considered as a discrete elements of uh, particles. And uh, here uh, there is uh, the, the powder boundary and all these things are automatically being generated. But the challenge in, in this case, uh, but now with the adoption of the supercomputer, the challenge has been restricted that how many powders or particles I should take into consideration. And in practice, there are millions and millions of powder particles are present. And uh, depending upon the size and shape, so it's quite complex scenario, depending upon the size and shape, the, uh, the, the, it, it actually, the particle packing is going to be behaved, the stress di distribution is going to behave, and the interparticle friction, uh, because if, if the aspect ratio of the powder, each by D ratio of the powder is quite higher, if it is like a flex shape, it will generate a huge amount of interparticle friction. Now, if the, uh, if the particle is almost a spherical shape, the interparticle friction is very, very less. So these all these things need to be taken into consideration. Uh, and therefore, uh, uh, therefore, one of the very uh, important aspect is that during the modeling, as higher will be the uh, number of particles that is taken into consideration, higher will be the accuracy of that. FEM will uh, take that into consideration and in the FEM process, uh, that, that uh, depends upon the constitutive modeling and that is actually the boundary that uh, the coordination number that means the boundary uh, has to be ensured that how one particle is touching with how many boundaries so that has to be has to be ensured uh, prior to uh, prior to the deformation process uh, prior to the actually the modeling so two things i have actually mentioned one is a constitutive uh, model one is the elastic in the elastic region and the plastic region uh, how the stress uh, distributions will uh, vary uh, so there are two different in the elastic because what is normally happening so during the compaction process, uh, with the increase in the pressure, first of all, there is a uh, enhancement in the particle coordination number. Then the elastic deformation will take this and further the plastic deformation will take this. So in the elastic deformation regime, so this particular constitutive equation has been valid and in the plastic design, the D epsilon, the strain uh, is valid with the uh, D, uh, lamb, D lambda, what is SK as it is a scalar uh, quantity and uh, the plastic potential function is incorporated uh, as a delta G by delta sigma. So this uh, model is basically taken into uh, account in the plastic design. So another factors what I was talking about that uh, in conventional uh, sintering process, uh, another challenge is that what need to be taken into account when I was, I, I will try to explain about what are the, uh, what are the uh, factors that is influencing the heat treatment process. So in conventional sintering process, Shrinkage is a factor. Why shrinkage is a factor? Because in the conventional sintering process, I, I discussed that the heating rate is very, very small. It is five to eight degree. So uh, the shrinkage, and obviously, if there is no shrinkage takes place, density uh, won't be enhanced. So in conventional sintering process, shrinkage uh, should be there so that the density will enhance. But shrinkage at the same time can reduce, can reduce the dimensional procedures. So I need to machine the sample. Sometimes it will become a convex shape. Sometimes the sample will become a con uh, concave shape. So I need to machine. So to remove all the convexity and concavity. And uh, it is observed that uh, from the equation is also observed that d delta L by L0 by dt, that is the rate of shrinkage is uh, uh, is uh, inversely proportional to the g, that is the uh, final, that is the size of the grain. So if the particle size is more and more fine, so it will try to develop more and more shrinkage. And uh, that will cause a significant amount of uh, a significant amount of uh, amount of problem as far as final uh, uh, as far as the final property is concerned. So I need to machine, and overall the cost of the process will getting uh, enhanced. So this is the uh, this is the overall aspect and rate of the rate of the sinkage need to be controlled by controlling the g value, the particle size. So every success of the process in any power synthesis mechanism depends upon uh, specifically as the nanostructuring depends upon either how much what is the extent of nanostructuring has taken place so now it is observed that if the particle size distribution is not very very narrow not very very wide I may mean, not very very wide means more number of finer uh, fraction is present 
so if that is the case uh, that if that is the case that is eventually can increase the shrinkage rate so that so uh, the idea of the researcher is to create a bimodal particle size distributions or uh, multimodal size distributions so that uh, so that more effectiveness uh, not only not only and, and also the particle size distributions should be getting optimized it should not be very high it should not be very less and that can be evaluated from the geometric gsd geometrical standard deviation value uh, so uh, so in that way the shrinkage uh, rate by controlling the particle size the shrinkage rate and also controlling the sintering uh, temperature and time the shrinkage rate can also be reduced so a uh, change in the length of the sintered product that i was talking about that uh, with the help of the continuum sintering uh, theory model uh, uh, that, that there is uh, the actual continuum sintering theory is basically representing the actual microstructure because in real practice the microstructure development is a real challenge that actually what happens due to the change of the nature of the particle shape amount of strain that is been uh, incorporated what is the shape and size of the uh, particle everything actually contributes on the microstructure and even things are going to be little complex when there are liquid are present for an example if i'm going for solid state sintering whereas uh, the, uh, the the elements are uh, having high melting point but my sintering temperature is quite less so uh, things are not very complex but when, when i go into the liquid phase sintering where a certain material is getting uh, partially melted so more and more uh, uh, more and more characteristics is going to be incorporated in the microstructure and uh, my uh, things is going to be more and more complex so because the liquid will try to incorporate its own capillary pressure and uh, 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 that has to be taken into consideration during the microstructure uh, in the, uh, the through the modeling uh, or the phase specifically by the phase field modeling process so now i have just shown that what uh, what could be the typical understanding about the sintering uh, process so uh, one uh, very typical understanding about the relationship between the uh, sigma ij that is basically the external stress uh, taken as a cauchy stress tensor a external stress uh, in the specifically in the uh, pressure stress sintering that has been taken how much uh, stress is basically applied uh, during the heat treatment process and uh, pl delta ij is basically the capillary stress so when i was talking about when i will take the uh, liquid phase sintering into consideration the dominance of the pl delta ij that uh, dominance will be more and more higher because the liquid what is present will provide more and more capillary pressure uh, and uh, that will also contribute to the overall uh, con contribute to the overall densification so, uh, the, so the it has a relationship with the overall stress factor and also uh, the sigma I, uh, epsilon ij is the divergent of the stress uh, strain standard tensor and the w is basically capital w is basically the equivalent strain so both are uh, taken into consideration so this is the solid state uh, pressure stress sintering and uh, this pl uh, delta ij is basically the uh, is basically the when uh, internal pressure has been developed when there is a capillary stress is generated and that is actually contributing to the densification process here i can uh, here i have shown that uh, what are the operative mechanism that is contributing uh, in the densification process so uh, it is observed that if the grain size is in a very uh, in a very effective uh, uh, understanding or in very theoretical perspective of understanding uh, that if the particle size is small the grain boundary area will be large and the uh, grain boundary diffusion or the mass transfer to the grain boundary short circuiting channels will be more and more efficient so the densification will be higher but it is not the exact case so only the finer particle distribution is not going to only contribute in uh, or contributing in densification so uh, there are six factors there are six type of uh, mass transfer one is the surface diffusion based uh, surface lattice diffusion vapor transport uh, and then uh, the grain boundary diffusions plastic flow grain boundary lattice diffusions so uh, this factors which is contributing to the shrinkage some factors will won't contribute to the shrinkage but they will contribute in other factors uh, for an example 4 5 and 6 that means the grain boundary diffusions grain boundary lattice diffusion and plastic flow so uh, if i have a very fine size distributed particles so that will provide a enor enormous amount of grain boundary diffusion can be contributing to the densifications so if uh, the uh, plastic flow property of or uh, if uh, the dislocation moment is quite higher so that means how i can improve the plastic flow if i go on increasing the uh, temperature of sintering that means I, I am actually annihilating the dislocation so the plastic flow is going to be enhanced 
my day, my densification is going to be enhanced. So by this way, uh, that its contribution of the densification can be improved. And uh, uh, no contribution to the densification. Surface diffusion might have her, but it doesn't have that much of importance to improvement of the densification, even the paper transport or the surface lattice diffusion. Uh, it only causes, the, because these factors doesn't cause any shrinkage to the sample. Only shrinkage takes place when there is a densification. Why? Because during the densification, there is a grain size readjustment takes place. The grain will try to readjust among each other, and uh, then they will try to uh, shrink. When they try to readjust, for an example, I'm, I'm telling a very real life example that uh, in a, uh, in a particular uh, in, in a particular uh, uh, container, there are many uh, um, uh, many components are present. It is basically scattered. So now, uh, if I'm trying to gather, if I'm trying to readjust all this and try to uh, try to give a shape, so the over it, it will try to densify. So the area is going to be densified. So densified means uh, the, the the area where most number of particles are present. So uh, in that particular way, if there is no uh, shrinkage, if there is no readjustment takes place, so grain size readjustment takes place or particle size readjustment takes place in the pre uh, sintering stage. So there is no contribution to the densification will happen. So uh, this is uh, how the uh, sintering has been facilitated by the liquid phase. So just try to understand that the there are solid particles are present and then there are liquid particles are present. So uh, after, during the heat treatment process, what is happening, the solid grains are soluble. So it depends upon the solubility. How much so, how much uh, solubility is present. So these understanding are very, very important to develop a uh, material or when even in the modeling phase itself. So how much solubility a solid will uh, exhibit in the liquid. For an example, if uh, I'm dealing with tungsten and nickel, Tungsten shows a very smaller amount of solubility in the liquid nickel. If I if I'm increasing the temperature of uh, sintering to a temperature where it exceeds the uh, melting point of nickel, so nickel will get liquidified, and that is the concept of liquid phase sintering. That my temperature should be higher than the uh, at least one of the melting point and one of the melting point of the element. So the uh, if the solubility of the tungsten grain is very very less, so eventually that uh, is not uh, effective as far as liquid phase uh, sintering is concerned. So the, the solids uh, constituents would get dissolved and then they will reappear in the surface of the uh, surface of the particle. So this is this is one way uh, how this uh, re so after that there will be readjustment will take place and then solution uh, reprecipitation will take place. That means uh, so first of all there is a solutionizing solid particle will get in the solutions and then they will reprecipitate on the surface and uh, finally uh, there will be grain growth which is contributed to the densification so and in between the liquid that is present will cause the pore filling mechanism whatever the porosity is present internal porosity is present so the liquid filling is going to uh, increase uh, is, is going to fill the pores now uh, two things can happen the pores can be elongated and uh, because i'm going into more of the micro mechanics because this is very very important if i'm going into uh, in that particular scale where pore shape is also quite important if the pores uh, that are of elongated shape of the, the pores are of round shape what is going to happen so uh, this is a, a real classical example that uh, elongated pores and the round pores formation depends upon the dihedral angle. What is dihedral angle? In the next uh, few slides, I'm just trying to discuss about that. Take an example of a solid liquid and a vapor. So if a solid uh, liquid is actually getting, uh, whether it is getting uh, wetted, depending upon the extent of wetting, so the extent of, uh, because the extent of densification also depends upon that. So if the if uh, the theta is basically the contact angle between the gamma LV and the gamma SL, and uh, if the theta value is low, that means the liquid fills the solid network of the grain. So that means the and the grain bonding will take place, and the, eventually the densification is going to enhance. So if the uh, contact angle is going to be less, so that means the uh, the densification is also going to be less. And uh, also the grain size and the pore size is also depends upon the uh, psi value. That is basically also the dihedral angle and uh, uh, so if the dihedral angle is less, then there will be grain growth and there will be densification. As I've told about that, the contact angle and the dihedral angle concept is almost same. So uh, if uh, the dihedral angle is less, there will be grain growth, uh, there will be complete weighting of the uh, solid, and that is required for uh, liquid phase sintering and for densification. If the dihedral angle is uh, high, then there will be pore growth, pore growth will take place, and the pore will get isolated and pore sending of the pore will take place, and that will reduce the densification. So that is quite important that the dihedral angle has to be lower. 
and uh, in, in in other case it has to be ensured that the green boundary energy and the solid liquid interfacial energy also depends upon the triangle angle so uh, the so it has observed that if uh, the if uh, pore growth can take place and uh, and specifically if that phi if, if the dihedral angle value is going to be higher that means green boundary uh, if the phi value is quite higher so the green, so what is going to happen that uh, uh, this uh, green boundary energy to solid liquid interfacial energy is going to be quite uh, uh, less that means if, if the higher value of phi psi so it is also going to be less if the value of uh, psi is quite less in zero degree so the green boundary energy is going to be uh, higher than the li solid liquid interfacial energy and that also can contribute to this ratio is also going to contribute to the pore size so uh, so higher will be the so uh, higher will be the value of this psi the uh, sphericity of the force is also going to uh, also going to change to more and more to the uh, more and more to the uh, globular shape so this is how this uh, uh, this diagonal angle is going to conceptualize in the uh, densification process now i'm coming to the certain of the modeling aspect of the spark plasma sintering process in the spark plasma sintering process so what is basically happening what is the difference between this is an advanced way of uh, sintering so what is the major difference major difference is that uh, in the spark plasma sintering process there are uh, die and punch are present as similar there is one electrode at the upper electrode and the uh, bottom electrode is present and the whole process takes place in the vacuum chamber and a pulse dc generator is there which actually creates the spark discharges so when uh, uh, when the die is applying pressure certain amount of spark discharges it is uh, supplied through the die uh, spark discharges actually takes place and that actually spark discharges is uh, cleaning the surface of the powder and cause a very efficient contact or bonding between powder to powder so electrical spark liberations supported by the particle surface vaporizations uh, and melting takes place uh, so that will leads towards the significant uh, uh, necking uh, or, or neck development and uh, obviously uh, the higher heating rate in this particular aspect will lead to hinder the particle growth so uh, i have just uh, provided a simple model that will uh, give an idea that if i take the z axis that means the longitudinal axis and the uh, and and the uh, one one of the axis in the radial direction so uh, how the delta t by delta t that means the temperature variation so from this particular uh, model the fluctuation of the temperature distributions can be ensured so uh, delta t by delta small t is equal to 1 by r delta r by r and uh, these are the uh, i am not going to go through every details of the factor so the most important thing that is eventually uh, required is that the uh, that the qi value joule heating based heat evolution how much amount of heat evolution takes place uh, that actually uh, can give a provide an understanding about the temperature distribution delta t by what is how much amount of temperature is generated uh, with respect to time uh, if uh, the cp is for a particular material is constant the thermal conductivity in the radial direction and thermal conductivity in the longitudinal directions that is taken uh, into considerations so if i go on increasing the joule heating rate the density density is also going to increase the rho value is also going to increase provided the uh, if the temperature is higher then uh, with respect to time that the rho value is also going to increase so uh, and and also the current can also be regulated in i and z directions in this, by this particular model and two things can be ensured in this particular model that one two factors one is the uh, heat loss can take place also uh, heat loss can take place by water cooling way and heat less loss can also take place by radiation so the the whole there is a water chiller is associated with that because a higher amount of temperature is generated so you need to cool, cool the whole setup so the the cooling the flux heat flux basically depends upon the hc uh, uh, it's ac Uh, how much amount of heat loss and the surface temperature of the inner die and the surface uh, and the temperature of the water so that is uh, related with that and the radiation depends upon the uh, t1 and t2 value that is the graphite surface temperature and temperature of the assembly surface inner surface and uh, it depends upon the emissivity uh, that is a epsilon value of the graphite uh, and uh, the surface uh, stress that is related with uh, sigma as well so this is a uh, how the uh, losses can be equated during the spark plasma and how the temperature uh, distributions of temperature change with the related to time and the current uh, density change with related to the uh, with uh, relative with the axial directions or the longitudinal directions can be evaluated uh, from this process. now i am just going into the more uh, details of uh, the different models that is uh, related with the uh, evaluation of the particle process 
so because i was talking that if i can control the particle uh, shape size the strain and the and uh, even the density of the particles so that is eventually can uh, can control the final property three different models are actually uh, being very very popular one is called the uniform deformation model sometimes it is also known as the williamson hall plot which gives an idea about the crystallite size and the lattice strain a uh, uniform stress deformation model which is called as a usdm we uh, take the stress is uniform all through it gives the stress distribution and the crystallite size and a uniform stress uh, uniform stress energy de uh, deformation model so that is energy is basically not uh, visible here uniform stress energy uh, deformation model so this give the energy density and the crystallite size so uh, actually what is happening that uh, the one thing is quite important to understand that if i go for an xrd study of a powder what should i get i will get a simple peak like this the intensity versus uh, two theta value and uh, uh, I, i will get a fwhm for individual peak so fwhm means what is the width at the half maximum what is the maximum intensity and half of that uh, and half of that length what is the width so that is called the width uh, full width at half maxima and sometimes it is noted at the uh, broadening effect so the broadening can takes place uh, due to several reason during deformation any deformation broadening can takes place the broadening can takes place due to the crystal refinement the broadening can takes place due to the increase in the lattice strain the broadening can takes place due to the instrumental broadening so three factors are uh, important in the broadening that can uh, that can cause the final uh, fragmentation of the particles or how much uh, particle size has refined so now Uh, how can we can evaluate the process uh, in the udm process so it is expected that the uh, br that means the resultant broadening is a contribution from the b crystallite and the b lattice strain so both the strain value and the crystallite size refinement is causing the uh, br or the or the or, or, or the broadening resultant broadening so if uh, this br crystallites uh, from the williamson hall plot it is related with k lambda by l cos theta and b strain basically is related with 4 epsilon tan theta so if i get uh, really uh, if, if i try to uh, deduce it from uh, br cos theta is equal to k lambda by l plus 4 epsilon sin theta so if i simply um, plot it that won't uh, give a very proper understanding of that so what is basically i need to do i should also include the observed broadening so that means the uh, observed broadening means what the broadening when there is no strain is present that means the pores are great so if uh, the uh, some sample is uh, some samples we get which is of pores are great and there is no strain is present before the starting of the um, uh, of the deformation process if coarsening of the grain can be achieved and uh, uh, then uh, by with the help of xrd uh, b is, uh, zero value can be uh, deduced and uh, by subtracting uh, bi will give the resultant br value and by simply plotting uh by by simply plotting br cos theta and uh, sin theta i can get a uh, get a simply uh, linear fit and with the help of the slope intercept i will get the value of the crystallite size and the lattice strain so this is a simplified model that can provide both the crystallite size and the lattice strain so now uh, k for k is basically the shape factor it depends upon the shape but uh, specifically for the cubic crystals it is taken as 0.94 into consideration so that is called the uniform deformation model and uh, specifically it gives an idea that uh, how to evaluate the uh, lattice strain and how to evaluate the crystallite size so in the uniform stress model uh, br cos theta is uh, basically k lambda by l plus 4 it's uh, sigma sin theta by y so y is basically the young modulus and uh, specifically sigma is basically the stress so instead of uh, there is no y instead of epsilon here the y is taken and sigma is taken into considerations and uh, in uniform uh, deformation energy density model udedm so where u is equal to a epsilon square uh, y by 2 taking that into consideration and simply replacing that we give the same uh, equations which is deduced from the williamson hall br cos theta is equal to k lambda by l plus 4 sin theta root over 2 u by y so similarly in all the cases simply a plot with br cos theta by uh, 4 sin theta into 2 by y to the power uh, 2 by y uh to the power half so that will give the value of u to the power half so uh, from the uh, from the intercept slope k lambda by l and l can be deduced from there and from the slope itself uh, we will get the energy density so what is the energy is been evolved so we can understand during that if we can understand that how much energy is been incorporated by simply a modeling by simply doing an experimental xrd uh, we can simply understand 
and we can correlate uh, with uh, that how much of energy is actually incorporated uh, inside the uh, inside the sample uh, during the deformation itself. So these three different models are used depending upon the requirement. So now I have just uh, uh, summarized a uh, few slides are left. So I have summarized the application based ODS allow as that it reads very high strength, the high density, high elongation, high toughness, and high oxidation resistance. And what needs to be done so that uh, uh, the high density can be achieved if I go with a bimodal particle size distribution, if I go with a high pressure acid sintering, if I go with a high temperature sintering process, and even with a liquid phase sintering process. So, uh, so that is uh, one way how I could uh, uh, go with a, a high strength, that means the dispersion sintering by oxide, presence of the intermetallics. Uh, even uh, presence of the intermediates will give a very high strength, enhanced densifications, grain refinement, both are contributing to the high strength. High elongations is also quite important. I can achieve the high elongation by oxide doping inside grain rather than dispersing the oxides at the grain boundary. Optimizing the oxide content, I cannot go on increasing the oxide content that can also have a adverse effect on the elongations and uh, reduce contiguity. What is contiguity? I will come a little later. Uh, this is a very important aspect as far as the microstructure is concerned and increase the matrix volume person. If, I, if I'm doing with uh, uh, ferritin microstructure or if I'm doing with the uh, uh, refractory gate microstructure, uh, so the, the base material uh, matrix volume should be increased. High toughness can be increased, enhanced by simply by bimodal grain size distribution. If I get more and more coarser grains and finer grains, so that can be achieved. Uh, oxide doping inside the grains and uh, uh, eventually also reduce the contiguity can also give rise to the improvement of the toughness. High oxidation resistance we can achieve by reduction of the porosity, grain size modifications. If I go on coarsening to some extent, lesser grain boundary area can provide more and more uh, amount of uh, uh, ox uh, reduced oxidations. Uh, and uh, specifically the continuous scale formations and uh, by controlling uh, by uh, having low thermal expansion coefficient of oxide. So oxide with a low thermal coefficient of expansion can also provide a suitable uh, improvement in the high oxidation resistance. So uh, just try to give a overall understanding about the uh, how the microstructure during the heat treatment of the alloy can be uh, processed through simulating the phase field, uh, that means by the phase field modeling. And from there, the thermal temperature variations and the force regulating the curvature, because I'm talking about when there is a temperature, the, the shape and the size of the uh, grains is going to change. So there will be curvature is going to change during the process, uh, even uh, whether it's a pressure acid sintering, whether it's a capillary acid, whether the liquid pressure is present or there or not. So uh, even uh, delta phi n by delta t, that means with uh, temperature, uh, what is the order orientation of the uh, grains that can be equated with uh, M phi, that is the isotropic phase field movement, uh, which is a uh, little bit M sigma by epsilon square. Epsilon is the coefficient of gradient energy and uh, sigma is basically the grain boundary energy. So that can be equated and uh, uh, and, and also the M is a grain boundary mobility. So that can uh, taken into consideration. So uh, by, by equating or from this, it, uh, I can get actually the orient grain orientations with respect to time. If I go on increasing, so t is basically if I go on increasing the sintering time at, with a specified time period, what will be the uh, orientation of the grain that I can get out, uh, get it uh, from the particular uh, simulation of the phase field. Now, as I was talking about the contiguity, which is really very important in the in understanding or in order to improve the toughness of an alloy. So, uh, a very typical example in a uh, in a liquid phase sintering, if I go on uh, increasing, if I if I go on adding a liquid phase in, in a solid phase, so and if I draw a line, how much uh, area? The basically, contiguity is basically the surface area of the solid uh, and uh, uh, two into surface area of the solid and uh, divided by two into surface area of solid. Uh, uh, plus surface area of the solid and, uh, and and liquid. So basically, it is a uh, solid solid surface area two into multi uh, multiplied by surface area. How many surface area of solid to solid? So that means one grain solid, one grain solid. So uh, so surface area of the solid to solid grain, uh, it is uh, contiguous and uh, surface area of the solid and liquid. So where, where it is actually cutting. So if I draw a straight line, where it is actually cutting? That means it is the surface area of the solid solid and the surface area of the liquid solid over here. Take, will be taken into consideration to uh, deduce the contiguity. And uh, ill strength um, of a, any material can be contributed specifically for the ODS alloy. It is a contribution of four different factors. Specifically, the strength can be generated from the matrix, uh, and strength can be contributed by the grain boundary, strength can be contributed by solid solution strengthening, and strength also can be contributed by the oxide particle uh, strengthening, but it's basically the, the uh, we sometimes call it say R1 strengthening, because the R1 mechanism 
uh, as i've already discussed in very few first slides that how the, the dislocation movement is basically by the boeing phenomena so that can also sometimes fall as a or one mechanism so i'm not going into every details of uh, the um, uh, equation so every uh, typical uh, uh, every, every typical strength is contributing to the final yield strength of the property and uh, that is related with the grain boundary uh, uh, volume fractions and it is related with the d value that means what is the uh, grain size the grain boundary strengthening depends upon that increasing uh, reducing the grain size is going to increase the grain boundary strengthening we sometimes talked about we we, we give a strength the overall strength but the overall strength is a contribution of the four factors so whatever the uh, factors uh, i have reported over here that is basically the contributing to overall strength of the alloy and uh, sigma zero is basically 2 mu uh, 2m mu uh, and uh, x power minus 2 pi a by b into 1 minus mu. that is basically the uh, so uh, new is basically uh, here is the portion ratio portion ratio is also important in this context and uh, m is basically the taylor factor and uh, uh, and also another important factor is the uh, lambda value that is lambda is basically written over here the interparticle spacing so if the interparticle spacing is quite uh, uh, less so that can also increase the r1 strengthening and the last equations i have uh, mentioned that if the lambda value is quite less so the r1 strengthening or the uh, strengthening due to oxide particles is going to be in, uh, is going to be increased so the particle spacing uh, need to be uh, need to be enhanced uh, need to be uh, lowered as much as possible so that the r1 strengthening can be increased so this i just i'm trying to uh, cover up that what is basically uh, how it actually looks like so you can find it out that uh, a typical microstructure of a uh, oxide dispersion strength in alloy you can find it out there are particles that disperse the black size particles that disperse at the boundary and some of the particles are dispersed inside the matrix some are coarser in nature and some are finer in nature so this type of uh, structure is uh, actually required to improve both the strength and the toughness of the alloy and uh, and uh, by suitable uh, designing or simplify molecular level doping can also uh, uh, provide a significant importance in, in with respect to improvement of the toughness of the alloy and uh, another important aspect which can contribute in the final strengthening of the alloy is what is the lattice misfit that means if i go with uh, a simplified uh, tm study and uh, what is the lattice misfit and uh, even during the phase field modeling it is might be possible that uh, between the oxides and the uh, matrix what is the uh, distortions or how much amount of lattice misfit is present so uh, you can find it out the all the white color spots these are basically the atoms so you can find it out whether the orientation of the atoms are uh, similar or whether there is a distortion takes place at the interface from here it is very easy to um, uh, easy, easy to achieve and uh, uh, the way that can be evaluated is simply by measuring the uh, the lattice parameter of the precipitate particles and the matrix so simply by measuring the lattice parameter so if i go with a uh, if i go with a fft that is a fast fourier transformation mechanism so i can easily deduce uh, easily deduce the uh, what is the d spacing and uh, from that i can easily uh, comprehend the a value and the finally the lattice misfit so lattice misfit will give the mechanism of deformation so if the lattice misfit is very very high uh, that will uh, provide a uh, incoherent uh, matrix and if it is comparatively less uh, in the range of 0 to 1% or even um, in that particular range so it gives a almost a coherent uh, safe interface so that will provide the understanding uh, that how much what what is the contribution of the precipitate particle as per the strength is concerned so here i have shown that uh, a typical microstructure of the fracture surface of the sintered molybdenum titanium oxide uh, where uh, you can observe that the grain is not continuous uh, or, or the or the grain uh, cracking is basically not uh, continuous so there might be some uh, in, in 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 between there are some bridging takes place some of the particles actually getting bridged and crack is getting uh, crack is getting arrested over here and uh, so it is a very typical example of the oxide dispersion in alloy so uh, several papers actually reports this uh, kind of mechanism and uh, that can happen uh, by the, if there are dispersion oxides are present which is a nanoform uh, which have a very high surface energy that can consume the, or that can uh, uh, reduce the crack uh, propagation uh, uh, by consuming the crack propagation energy and that can also uh, contribute in improvement of the fracture toughness so uh, one very important aspect for a uh, ballistic application is the high fracture toughness adequate elongation of 6 to 8% and very high temperature uh, stability so high fracture toughness by with a suitable microstructure like this uh, can be fracture uh, fractography can be very very effective in order to improve the 
uh, improve the uh, toughness of the alloy and for application oriented uh, uh, in the specifically in the ballistic based application. So simply, I'm just trying to conclude with a few slides that uh, in the armor application, what are the most important factors? And in the nuclear application, what are the most important factors? So in armor application, the tungsten ODS alloy, it shows that uh, adiabatic shear band formations because stress concentration at the grain boundary is facilitated by the dispersed oxide. If the dispersed oxide is present at the grain boundary, it will cause a significant amount of stress concentrations and uh, it will favor the grain boundary debonding where it will develop early crack development can, can take place rather than only tungsten heavy alloys. Uh, and that, that will lead towards the adiabatic shear band formations and self softening effects, so that the uh, so that the impact is much more higher. And uh, uh, specifically, the, uh, the, the I have written down the equation. So sigma is basically the equivalent stress, which is treated with the yield stress value, the modulus of hardening, and strain hardening exponent. So a lot of uh, factors are involved into that, and eventually the melting temperature is also involved. So a simplified Johnson Cook model has been used to understand. The effect of the stress on different other parameters uh, to uh, develop certain idea about uh, uh, why while developing this kind of alloy. And uh, so, uh, what are the factors need to be uh, defined? Uh, need to be understand uh, during this model that the armor plate dimension need to be designed and dimension of the fragment, whether it's a spherical fragments or whether it's a uh, whether it's a cylindrical fragments. The velocity of the uh, of the of the kinetic energy a penetrator and also the time. Uh, of uh, how fastly it will reach and uh, it will, will reside on the uh, due to the impact. So these are the factors that need to be decided and uh, with a certain boundary conditions. So the velocity will start from zero and what is the maximum velocity will reach during the impact. So that will has to be ensured uh, and and, in, and uh, that will provide a uh, typical understanding about the modeling aspect of uh, this tungsten ODS alloy in armor application. Specifically in the plasma facing material, I'm just trying to conclude one very interesting observation is that uh, initially, the plasma facing material having a problem. What I was talking about the initial few slides that the bubble agglomerations by dispersion of the nano oxides. So, if the nano oxides uh, uh, are, are present, so they can actually uh, provide a sufficient amount of grain boundary, and, and that can also cause significant amount of uh, sinking of all the defects generated. It can also restrict the agglomeration of the bubble, it doesn't allow the bubble uh, to get agglomerated. And also, quite important that. The transmutation effect. That means if uh, tungsten is uh, converted to rhenium or it converted to osmium, it might happen that during this bombardment of the neutrons, tungsten uh, will can convert in a, a extensively within extensive time. It can convert into other isotope of rhenium and other isotope of osmium. And uh, it also depends upon what is the extent of radiation. And these osmium and radium are basically radioactive isotopes and can uh, create uh, hazards. So that's why uh, this uh, transmutation effects need to be controlled uh, and, and therefore uh, lower activation uh, material, for an example, uh, vanadium based alloys are, uh, are, uh, or ODS alloys are much more effective in that context to get uh, this uh, reduce, to get uh, released from this transmutation effect so that no radioactive isotopes can be generated or whatever the isotopes are generated are not radioactive. And uh, the extent of radiation, uh, that is the display. Uh, so we always talk when we are talking about the radiation that is uh, represented in terms of DPA, that is the displacement per atom. That means uh, if I talk it as a one DPA, that means after giving a radiation of one DPA, uh, every atom has displaced at least once from their own original site. And uh, this extent of uh, radiation, if I go on increasing, uh, so uh, the uh, so this oxide size need to be related with the reduced oxide size and high oxide number density. So if the oxides are present in higher number uh, and the oxide size is quite less, so it is it can uh, happen that the extent of radiation uh, is uh, is uh, uh, will will go on increasing. And also strength of the how I can develop the strength of the sink of the oxide. So specifically, two things are quite important: the grain boundary strength and the strength of the oxides. So strength of the sink of the oxides because oxides can also encapsulate some amount of the bubble and can also get liberated of the negative impact of the bubbles. So this uh, oxide strength is basically uh, is basically related with the oxide surface area and uh, the oxide number density. So and, and specifically this is boundary that in the sink of the uh, grain boundary is related with the uh, a 15 by h square. So uh, specifically it is the uh, grain uh, is, is a grain boundary uh, over overall grain boundary width area. So if I uh, if if uh, that, that that is related with how the strength of the sink is going to be concerned. So fine oxides and higher density of the oxides are more effective. 
against resistance of the volumetric expansion or swelling behavior. So this is uh, need to be ensured why ODS alloys are uh, so much of interest at present times. So I've uh, come to the conclusions that uh, ODS alloy have the potential of high temperature structural applications. The microstructure of the ODS alloys can be modulated by suitable processing uh, conditions, temperature, pressure, and time. And uh, this temperature, te pressure, and time need to be modeled to understand a better control about the uh, experimental setup. So modeling of the process parameter can and properties can provide an in-depth understanding to design the experimental setup. And uh, so both uh, modeling and experimental can provide a development of a bulk scale uh, product uh, in com commercial applications. Modeling can provide also fundamental understanding of stress distribution, temperature distributions during alloy design, which can direct to control the experimental conditions with an objective to minimize the deviation in the final property. That means the uh, if I can have an understanding about the stress distribution uh, in a sample, temperature distribution in the sample, so I can understand what uh, what is the extent of uh, deviation in the final property and how much uh, final how much uh, the value of the final property or what what are the properties that I have proposed or anticipated I can achieve or not or how much will be the deviation. So uh, the application oriented challenges can also be count, counteracted and can be comprehended suitably by modeling to achieve a possible solution. Whatever the problems, so as far as the alloy designing concerned or application oriented problems uh, that can also be uh, challenged and can be comprehended well by the help of modeling. Uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Professor Omshwan Patro, for your nice talk. Thank you, thank you so much. So now the this is this forum is open for discussion. Anybody <laughs> has any question, any doubt, please raise your hand. We'll unmute you and you can directly interact with the still speaker. Anybody has anything to say, please? Okay, so if there is no question, then again, thank you, Professor Ukshwan Patru, for this kind of enlightening lecture. And thank you so much. And with your due permission, we are going to close uh, this session. Thank you, sir. Thank you, uh, thank you very much for uh, giving me the opportunity to present uh, the talk. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, sir. And uh, uh, Mr. Narendra, uh, please upload uh, uh, the next tomorrow morning session, 9 o'clock timing and the morning session link in the WhatsApp. Okay. Okay. Oh, yes, thank okay. You. Thank you.